guys are having a, a good week. It's been, uh, it's been a rough week for, for our family with Luna. Um, for those of you who don't know, thank you for your prayers for those of you who have been praying. But Luna, uh, at the start of the week, had a stroke, and she's been battling these episodes for a while. Um, and uh, so the first few days, she could barely walk. She just, if she took a step, fall over. And, uh, and she uh, couldn't eat. She was just in pain for, for days. And they put her on like a, a stroke recovery medicine. And she's actually here this morning. And she's terrorizing the preschool. So thank you for your prayers. Uh, because he's a good God. And, and we need each other in times of trouble, right? And so this is our community. This is our family. And I want to thank you for being family to us if you guys have reached out and prayed. And the bottom line is, this is kind of funny. I don't stress about a lot of things. I just don't. I'm not a big stressor, which bothers my wife, actually. Because I've heard her on multiple occasions, like in high-stress situations, she'll, say, she'll be like, why, why are you not freaking out here? Like she'll often wonder, do you have a pulse? Or are you even alive? Um, and we've had a lot of things go down in the course of our marriage together uh, that are deemed like by most people as stressed stress-worthy worthy experiences. Like we've had multiple kids that have had heart transplants. We've had kids living in the hospital for months, for, for years at a time, right? Insane stuff. You combine the medical issues with the fact that five of our kids are adopted. And if any of you families have gone through the adoption process of taking this child and bringing them into your family, and then the sometimes violent transitions that, that can come about as a result of that, like you combine that with the medical issues and you have a perfect recipe for like conflict and, 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 and struggles and challenges. And, uh, and then, by the way, losing your home to a house fire in the middle of all of that, it's a lot that didn't make things easier. And I'm not telling you this to garner your pity. You can keep your pity for yourself. I don't really want it. I'm telling you this because quite honestly, when weird things happen like that, they don't actually stress me out. And Emily pokes fun at me because like, like if something just odd that is a new trial in our life happens, like I come out from the grocery store and a load of bricks has fallen from an airplane and landed on my car and decimated, I'd just be like, oh man, it stinks. And she'd be like, aren't you? Well, what's the deal with you? Do you she what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I don't know. These things happen, which is my expression. is just like, no, no, no. These things happen to you. In fact, there's only... One aspect of my life, really, that kind of stresses me out. Does anybody know, by the way, can anybody guess what you think the, the part of life for me that stresses me out is? Anybody? Fantasy football. <laughs> Without a doubt. It's the one thing, it, by the way, how many people, Ray, show of hands here if you are a fantasy football player. Just put your hand up nice and high. We got a bunch, you got a bunch over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are the real saints in the church. So, but here's what, like, and this is why it stresses me out, because this is why we play, if we're to be honest here, why we love it so much, those that have, have delved into that world and then cannot get out of it, it's because of the illusion of control, right? I get to go to a, I get to draft a team of players, and I pick this one, and I don't want you on my team, and I draft a team of players, and then I get to decide every week who I put in my starting lineup, you're playing for me. I'm not feeling good about you right now. No, 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 you ticked me off last week. You're staying on my bench. And I make all of these choices, and I put them in my lineup, right? And I can drop people that frustrate me. I can trade people to, to other teams if I don't want them on my team anymore. And, and here's the bottom line. Here's, here's why it stresses me out. Because even though I'm making all these moves, I have no control at all. Like, I have no control over whether or not a coach, you know, I put the quarterback in and they say, we just want to run it 50 times today. Or the quarterback decides to ignore my receiver that I need 25 points from to beat my opponent. I have no control over what actually happens on the field. And so that's where the stress comes in, right? If I knew that this running back would have 25 points and this one would have three, that would be easy. Right, Because if you know how things are going to end, it removes the stress from the situation. Right? Isn't that true about life? If you know how things will end, the stress is just not there. At least it's been my experience. It's why as a Christian I can have a lot of fun, believe it or not. Because I can laugh my way through life, I can poke fun at things, um, I can prank my friends and family and not take myself too seriously. Why? Because I know how things end for me. Like my future is sealed. I know where I'm going. He paid the price. So life can be 
relaxing in a way when you know how things end. Will you bow your heads and pray with me this morning? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We're in the middle of a mini-series called Know Thy Enemy. And uh, last week, Scott talked about the scene in the garden, right, where the enemy shows up and begins to wreak havoc and what went down in the garden. And then he talked about the showdown in the desert between the evil one and the holy one and what happened. And it all culminated in the message in this little verse in James chapter 4 that says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And so you know from the garden that, that and maybe they didn't resist the devil and it was, it was, the results were devastating. And then Jesus did resist the devil and the devil left. And We learned some things through that. This morning I want to do something a little bit different. Because I meet a lot of Christians who are a little bit stressed and anxious about what the devil might be up to and the attacks the devil might have on their lives and the the things that might, because of the enemy, come in their direction. And they're worried that somehow the enemy's going to take them out or hurt them in a way that they won't recover. They're going to fall. And I get it. Because the Bible, let's be honest, says some terrifying things about the devil, right? Like, for example, Ephesians chapter 6, this is Paul talking, says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Take up the full armor of God. Listen, any time that you're about to do something and they say, hey, you need to get armor on for this, you know something's up there so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. First struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers in this dark world and against spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. How freaky is that? Like he's scheming and planning things against me? There's spiritual forces at work? Like what's that about? And then you look down a little bit further, and verse 17 says this, in addition, take up the shield of faith. So now I need a shield to be a Christian. (laughs) What? Which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Flaming arrows? Nobody told me about that when I signed up for Jesus. What the heck? Is that the picture, by the way, of an enemy that's content just to chill and lay low? He's on the attack, and he's coming at me, and by golly, if I'm not prepared, if I'm not dressed right, I don't have the armor on, I don't have my shield of faith, he's going to take me out? Like, what? That's scary stuff. And that's just, that's just Paul. What about Peter? How about this verse? 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be alert and of sober mind. I get that. And then this, Your enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Like, I don't know about you, how many people here saw the movie Ghost in the Darkness? Yeah. Remember that, 19, I think it's the 1898, the Uganda railway that they were, that these construction workers were building, the Ken Uganda railway. And this is based on a true story. And at night, these two man-eating lions would sneak into the camp where the construction workers were sleeping and like drag them out and tear them to pieces with their teeth. It was crazy stuff. And that's how the Bible describes the devil. Like a roaring lion that wants to drag me out of my bed at night and tear me to pee. How can I not freak out? Because it all goes back to what we said at the onset of the message, right? When you know how something ends, it removes the anxiety and the stress and the panic. And as we talk about know thy enemy and how things end, right? That's important, but I, I want to take a moment here. Uh, Because we need to figure out how things, and I want to take a moment to figure out kind of how things began when it comes to the devil. Like, you ever wonder, like, where where did the devil come from? How did he become, like, the enemy? Where did he get his power? Like, who made Satan? Like, who would do that? Why is he able to cause so much trouble? They're all great questions, right? And let's be clear. The Bible never, ever comes out and explicitly describes the beginning of Satan's origins. We do know, right, he's around before the creation of the world because he pops up on the scene when Adam and Eve are there. And we don't know for certain the exact details of where he originated, but there are some things we can know for certain, all right? So here's one of them. We can know that God created Satan, which probably sounds maybe uncomfortable 
for people to hear? Like, what do you mean? And I'm sure that some of you are probably wondering, so if God's all-knowing, like he, if he's omniscient, right, and he knew that if I create this being, this being's going to, you know, become evil and do all these horrible things, then why create him in the first place? Now, we're not going to answer that question this morning, but Colossians 1.16 says this, all things were created by him. All things uh, were created by him. Not some things, not just the things that we like, all things, ticks, mosquitoes, the devil, cats, no matter how evil they are now, thank you for the one clap. <laughs> created by him. All right, we also know, not only did, did God create the devil, we also know the devil used to be good. The devil used to be good, right? Because think about God, right? Is the source of beauty and goodness and truth. God creates only what is consistent with his nature. God creates only what is consistent with who he is. In other words, if God is good and beautiful and true, then what he creates is good and beautiful and true. Like every facet of creation, whether uh, things in heaven or things on earth created by God, they're either good, they're very good. Paul said it this way, 1 Timothy 4, 4. Everything God created is good, right? So we know those two things. So the devil was created by God, and the devil was originally good. The question is, like, what, what went wrong? Because if Satan was created by God and good, and he existed to, like we all do to serve and bring him glory, then, then what happened? I'm so glad you asked. Because the Bible seems to indicate that at some point there was an angelic revolt, a rebellion against heaven's king. And uh, the New Testament actually talks a little bit about this. 2 Peter 2, 4 says, For God did not spare his angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. There's more. Uh, Jude 1, 6 says, And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their proper dwelling. These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on that great day. So at some point, we don't know all the details. We don't know the timeline, but there was a rebellion. And those that were rebellious were cast from heaven, cast from his presence. And according to the text, they're waiting for judgment. The question is, who is Satan in all of this, right? So the devil right, known as, in the Bible, he's like the prince of evil demons, all indications are he was the ringleader, right? It was him who planned and recruited defectors and led in this heavenly devolt. As a matter of fact, in 1 John, he is called the first sinner or the one sinning from the beginning. The idea is this, he started it all. Like the devil is <laughs> captain and CEO of the demonic forces, and that the Bible talks about this is undeniable over and over again. Think about the titles that are ascribed to Satan in the Bible. Scripture calls him the evil one. Scripture calls him the ruler of this world. Scripture calls him the God of this age, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. So Scripture does not deny the fact that Satan is power and that Satan is in a place of authority over a group of people, but he is the ruler of the kingdom of the air. That's his position. He's the one spearheading attacks on God's people with power to bind or tempt or oppress. He's the master behind the mayhem, right? So that's his role in all of this. As theologian Michael Horton explains, a fallen angels are not treated as evil by creation. Like they weren't created these evil adversaries to God, but as followers of Satan and his mutiny. At one time, those glorious and powerful angelic agents, Satan was filled with pride and plotted the attempt of the heavenly coup, right? So, there's another possible allusion to Satan's fall from heaven. It's in the book of Isaiah. And I say possible because the prophet's actually talking about the fall of the king of Babylon in the text, right? Uh, but when he describes this event of the fall of king of Babylon, in so doing, he begins to veer into language that appears to be more uh, grandiose than talking about just a mere human. So that's why some people believe this is an allusion to that event that took place. It's in Isaiah 14. I'll read it to you right here. Uh, how you have fallen, verse 12, from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. 
You who have been cast down to earth, who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. You can begin to see why people think, man, this sounds a lot like the event that must have taken place when Satan led this rebellion. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of mountains of Fawn. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. Now, we need to be careful here with this text because this passage has an immediate context that we just described, right? It's describing the fall of the king of Babylon, world power at the time. But perhaps at the same time, it's describing Satan's fall from heaven. Now, we don't know this for sure, but oftentimes that's how biblical prophecy works. It's dual dimensional. There's two dimensions to it. We know this because you read the New Testament and Jesus will take a prophecy that was describing a very specific event in time and then he will give it a second meaning and the Apostle Paul does it. And that's how biblical prophecy works. The problem is this. You and I don't have the authority just to read the Bible and decide, I therefore think this is what this means if one of the New Testament authors don't come out and say that. So is there a chance it could be describing that event? Yes. Are we certain that it's describing that event? No. So we need to be careful with it. But here's the reality. Know thy enemy. Right? And I know that was a, a lot to track and follow. It's important. And it matters. Why? Because I know where I came from. And I don't mean Canada. Although I am one proud Canuck. I know how I began Genesis 1. I am created in the image of God. I'm a child of the king, right? I am, I am, he made me in this likeness to reflect his glory. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I know how I began, and I know how things end for me. I rebelled, right? It's called sin. And my sin separated me from God. But he paid the price for my freedom. So I'm no longer because of that on the side of the enemy. I'm now on the side of the king. And because of that, I know I am with him forever. So I know how I began. And I know how things end for me. And when you know how things begin, and you know how things end, everything else in the middle becomes doable. So you don't have to stress out. We found out what Satan is beginning, right? Created by God to serve him. Pride got the best of him. He led a rebellion. He, along with his posse, were kicked out of heaven. That's how things started for him. But how do they end for him? That's the question we're after. And I know I'm sharing this at the risk of offending those of you in this room who hate a good ending spoiled, right? By the way, Emily and I had an unpleasant, Emily's my wife, an unpleasant exchange a week and a half ago. So Dryden's club volleyball coach last year, because she's playing in college now, uh, Jimmy, Coach Jimmy, is also the coach at uh, Freedom High School in South Riding. And, um, and he's a good friend of mine and uh, loved Jimmy and his wife. But anyways, because Freedom is in our district, we get to play them twice a year. And I coach at Pedro High School. So we get to square off, and it's so much fun. Because they're in our district, they also play Battlefield. Battlefield is the devil, right? <laughs> and since we didn't have a game, I told Jimmy, I said, I, I want to come watch your game against Battlefield. And he's like, yeah, come to yours on, and Emily is going to be my date. The only problem was Dryden was playing a match that same night that was, it was televised. And, uh, and so I wasn't going to get to watch Dryden's match live, but that's no problem because if you, if you don't look at your phone and you, you, you don't know the score and then you watch it later, a few hours later, it's still just like you're watching it live. And so I was looking forward to that. And so we get into the car and we're, I'm so excited. Go cheer on a freedom and hopefully they beat Battlefield. And so we're driving down the road and I look over and Emily's got her phone in her hand. And she's watching Dryden's match. Right? And I'm like starting to get a little bit salty, right? Because she's watching the match and then she's like doing this. She's like, oh, <sighs> that's all. And she's huffing and puffing and grunting. And I'm like, so I know in my mind, man, things must not be going well. And so she's ruining it for me. And I'm trying to ignore it. I'm just trying to watch the road. And I can't contain myself anymore. And I turned to Emily and I said, please just turn that off and pay attention to me. You're beginning to notice that most of my marital stories don't end with me looking like the good guy. 
So she did. And uh, so we're watching, 20 minutes later, we, we're watching, we're sitting there in the stands, uh, Freedom v. Battlefield, and I'm trying to watch the game, and she's not saying a word. Like, she's totally giving me the cold shoulder, and you, I can tell she's upset. So this is what husbands say. Sweetheart, are you mad at me? Right? Because <laughs> we're dumb. We're clueless. We can't read the room. And so she's like, no, I'm fine. Women, is that all you got? That's the best you can do, right? So I'm like, sweetheart, like, tell me why you're mad, why you're so upset. And she's like, are you, I said, I just feel like you're mad at me. She's like, well, I was in the car. And I'm like, oh, that, I am so sorry, sweetheart. I just didn't want, I want to watch the match later. And I didn't want all the drama to be spoiled. And you're, you're, I am so sorry, right? Yeah. But like, I just, like not knowing how the match ends until I've had the chance to watch it. And if you want to wait until things are all said and done in history to figure out how things end for the devil, that's fine. It's your prerogative, but if that's the case, you, spoiler alert, just get up and go now. (laughs) Because I'm going to tell you, but I promise staying in the room to hear that is, is the right decision. Because this is one story that it benefits to know what happens in the end. So the Bible is clear how things began, right, and to a degree, but the Bible is extremely clear about how things end for the devil. So if you have your Bibles, Revelation chapter 20 is what I'm going to be reading right now. So I'll give you a moment to get there, because I'm giving me a moment to get there. Verse 1, Revelation chapter 20, and I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw them into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. Verse 7. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sands of the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, uh, the city that he loved. But fire, this is so great, came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them, here it is, underline, circle this, whatever you got to do, highlight this, was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and fall prophet have been thrown. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now that's a lot in that passage to take in. No way on earth am I going to try to unpack all of that in the text today. But let me sum up. We win. Yes, we win. That's how the whole thing ends with the defeat of the devil and he's thrown into the lake of fire. And if Revelation 20.10 is correct, he's not making a comeback. It's forever and ever and ever and ever. That's it, his days are numbers. He's the loser. It is over for him. And the best part is this. Not only do we know that, he knows it too. The second Jesus came back to life, game, set, match, over. He already knows he's lost the game. As a matter of fact, that's why he's doing what he's doing in the meantime. Because there's no victory for him. All he can do is interfere a little bit with God's plan as much as he can and deceive people over here and and somebody over there, but ultimately in the end it doesn't matter because the scoreboard ends. God won, the devil zero. And if you're with God, listen, you're on the winning team. That's why people use that expression before. The next time somebody reminds you of, the next time the devil reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. Here's why this matters. Because if you know how things started, and you know how it ends, what's there to be stressed out over, really? It's just a matter of what do I do in the meantime, and Scripture has given us the recipe of how to resist everything he does. So we don't have to live paranoid or anxious or wondering what the devil has planned next, and, but I meet people all the time. Everything difficult they go through in life, like, oh, the devil's attacking me. You may know people like that. I hear it all the time. 
my boss is mad at me constantly. I think the devil's attacking me, right? All the kids got the flu this year. <laughs> I think the devil's attacking me. Oh, I had to get brand new brakes and tires on my car on the same day because you're the only one on earth that happens to you. I think the devil's attacking me. Or I went through the drive through and McDonald's and the ice cream machine was broke, which happens every week. I think the devil's attacking me. Listen, the devil is real and he's personal. And he does have plans, but guess what? If your faith is in Jesus, if you're a child of God, you can just chill out because you're on the winning side of things and you've been given the recipe to beat him. There's nothing Satan can do about that. There's nothing. If you are dressed in faith, there's nothing the enemy can do to take you out. So be aware, yes. But stress? No. C.S. Lewis in the Screw Tape Letters said it this way. I love this. He said, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. So when it comes to all things demonic and who Satan is and the work of the evil kingdom, right, there, there are two errors you can make. One is this, to disbelieve in their existence. There's a lot of people that walk around and they rarely think about the fact that there are evil forces and there is an enemy and that he is real and that he does have plans and that is a big mistake. The second is this, to believe and then feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. Know thy enemy. I get it. And we know where he came from. And we know how it ends for him. So you don't have to be afraid. Know thy enemy and to me know thyself, right? Because I know where I came from and I know who I belong to and I know where I'm going. So the enemy can't touch me. Nope. Paul, the same Paul who warned us about the fiery arrows, right? And, and having to have the right armor, because man, the devil's got schemes. That same Paul, you know what he said about what Satan can't do to you? Romans 8, it was read earlier in the worship service. I love this passage starting at verse 31. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who can bring any charge against those who God has chosen? It is God who justifies. It is he that condemns. Uh, Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and he's also interceding for us. So who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble? I don't care what the enemy tries. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered a sheep to be slaughtered. Yeah, you are a target. Make no mistake about it. But can they defeat you? No. In all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, here it is, that neither death nor life, nor what's the next part of that, nor angels, nor demons, not even those powers, neither the present nor the future, any power, neither height nor death, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hey, Satan, can touch this. No, I'm just kidding. But he can't. I know, it's so good. Yeah, you, you know, at some point. Child of the 90s. You just can't ever escape it. He can't get through the shield of your faith. It's unbelievable. Bishop Kenneth Ulmer tells the story of uh, two men who walk into a museum and they see this painting on the wall of a chess match. And uh, one character in the painting looked like the, a man and the other character in the painting sitting across from him looked very much like the devil. The man in the painting was down to his last piece. And the name of the painting, the title was Checkmate. And one of the two men that was staring at the painting was actually an international chess champion. And something about this painting just intrigued him. And he couldn't stop staring. And he was trying to study it and figure the painting out. He was so captivated, so engrossed in the painting that the man who was with him started to just get a little bit bored and like, annoyed and like, what, what's the big deal here? And, and, and the chess champ said to his friend, listen, there's something about this painting that bothers me. So I want to study it. You can just go wander around, look at other things. I'm just going to be right here. I'll catch up with you in a while. And a while goes by. And finally, bored to tears, his friend comes back and the chess master said to him, we've got to find the person who painted this painting. 
we got to tell him he's either going to change the picture or he's going to change the title. I have determined that there's something wrong with this painting. And I know because I'm an international chess champ. And his friend remarked, like, are you losing your mind? You can't convince the artist to change the pitch at all. And then he asked the chess champ, like, what's wrong with the painting? The man replied. The chess champ said, it's, it's titled Checkmate. But the title's wrong. The king still has one more move. You see, 2,000 years ago, <laughs> the devil thought he had won. When Jesus was laid low into a tomb, had been crucified, beaten, beaten to death, and put in a tomb three days later, and the devil's gloating, and he thinks he has him. The, the, the thing that he forgot was this. The king has one more move. Listen, friends, I don't know what's going on in your life that's got you down. But I guarantee you there's some people in this room, you feel like the enemy's winning right now. And it's been attack after attack after attack in your life and you feel discouraged and defeated and depressed because the harder you try maybe and the more you pray and you cry out to God over and over again and you're just wondering, when is the relief coming? When does it end? I get it. I know. It may feel like the enemy is winning because can he bring temptations? Yes. Trials? Yes. Tribulations? I guess so. He can do all of that to, to try to get you down or to get you off mission or to stick it to God. But guess what, folks? The king has one more move. The devil already defeated. His future already sealed. He will be destroyed. And in the meantime, your faith will protect you. Because guess what? When you know how it begins... And you know how it ends. You have everything given to you by God to survive in between. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, You are awesome and mighty. And your works are unfathomable, undeniable. You are king and there is none like you. Father, we understand your word is clear that there is somebody known as an enemy who's trying to interrupt your work. But he can't be king. He will never be king. Not king of my life. Not king of the lives of anyone in this room. Because he has already defeated. And for everyone in this room who's maybe struggling with things that have come their way. And they're, they're feeling the pressure and doubt starting to sink in. And, and, and temptation is right in front of them. And they're, they're thinking about, Father, I thank you that you have given us the full armor of God, that we have the shield of faith. The devil can't touch anyone in this room if they belong to you. They are sealed. They were bought with a price. They belong to the king. And so all of our battles, I don't even know if we have to call them our battles because they belong to you and we claim victory in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.